morning, everybody. I have the honor to announce a talk by Stas Smirnov, Stanislav Konstantinovich Smirnov, but let me simplify it to Stas Smirnov. Uh, here's the title of the talk, Two-Dimensional Percolation Revisited. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, Stas Smirnov. He was born in 1970. Uh, then uh, his great successes when he was a child was, uh, he had twice gold medal on International Mathematical Olympiads in 1986 and 1987. Uh, he studied uh, at the State University of St. Petersburg. Uh, then he uh, moved to uh, Caltech, where he made PhD in 1996. His advisor was Nikolai Ma Nikolai Makarov. Let me <coughs> now briefly say about later things. He moved to uh, Sweden, to KTH, end of 20th century and first year 2000. Uh, he uh, involved in percolations and uh, such things, and he achieved great results. Uh, he received several prizes. Let me mention uh, one of them, Salem Prize, joined with Odette Schramm. And the, the greatest success, maybe, was uh, Mathematical successes were one after the other, but great success was uh, Fields Medal he received in 2010 uh, for conformal invariance of uh, scaling limits for per triangular percolation and also for uh, holomorphic, uh, for conformal invariance of uh, easing models. Uh, planar criticalizing model. Uh, he moved to Genève, where he is uh, till now uh, at the University of Genève, and he uh, founded and runs also Chebyshev Laboratory in St. Petersburg uh, State University. I think this is okay. <laughs> well, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Felix. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so thanks uh, very much for the invitation. It's very. It is very nice to to be back to Poland. It's it's actually I think first time I was here in 1986, as Felix said at the Olympiad, but that was in Warsaw. Uh, uh, and that's my first time in Krakow, which is absolutely beautiful city. So thank you very much for organizing a conference in this uh, place. Uh, and um, I spent significant part of my life doing subjects which are related to two out of four tracks of the conference, or maybe even three out of the four tracks, uh, which is very nice because I, there are many talks I want to go to. Well, in particular, I wrote two papers with Felix. Uh, but I'm going to speak about uh, something else, so I decided to give a sort of a hybrid talk, uh, which is on one hand expository, on the other hand I'll try to squeeze two proofs into a talk. So one friend of mine says that every math talk should have one proof, so uh, most people uh, contradict him by having zero proof, so I'll contradict by having two. Uh, well, uh, so uh, to deep percolation revisit it, I first have to say what is uh, percolation, and I'll later say why we do it in two dimensions. And the talk will have uh, two parts, uh, before CFT and after CFT. CFT is a conformal field theory, so it's before physicists uh, have come and told us what to do. Uh, and then we actually did something else, but <laughs> uh, before, bef before there were, there were some uh, input from physicists and after. And before, it's, it's a model which was uh, proposed first in serious mathematical literature by two British mathematicians, Broadbent and Hammersley, in 1957. <coughs> there it was a model of a gas 
going through filters in a miner's mask. Uh, well, there are also miners in Krakow, so it would be, have been appropriate. And um, the question was, uh, so you model some porous medium by a lattice, and you take the very easy model that uh, like every uh, place either has a hole or doesn't have a hole independently of each other with some probability. So you can think of it as, for example, there is a big city which is perfectly square, well, like Manhattan, Manhattan is a bit more rectangular, but there are cities where blocks are exactly square, and you think that uh, there is, uh, you fix a constant p, and each road is open with probability p and closed with probability 1 minus p. So there are road works or, I don't know, traffic uh, jams or something. So this is what it looks like when p is large, you can easily move. This looks what p is small, you see immediately that you stop, that there are these sort of independent islands where you can move, but you can't go through. Uh, and uh, what you, it's, it's sort of immediately clear from mathematician and it's, it's, uh, it requires a proof with coupling uh, uh, that when P increases, uh, probability that you can move, say, south to north through the city increases. Obviously, probability for a city of given size is always positive because there is always a positive probability that all roads are open. That, uh, but it increases, but what you see in experiments, what you see in life, that it doesn't kind of increase smoothly, continuously, that first it's almost zero when P is small, that you cannot move, even on this, on, on, what, what is it, so in this picture you cannot move. And then for larger values, you, you can move with probability close to one. So there is what a physicist call phase transition, it's sort of similar to uh, water boiling, that you change continuously temperature and it, uh, changes its properties, but at 100 degrees centigrade suddenly becomes gaseous. Or maybe even more, the, this phase transition is more like, like ferromagnetic one, when you hit a piece of iron, it's a magnet up to 1043 degrees Kelvin grade, then it's magnet not anymore. So one can ask what is this uh, Curie value where PC happens, in this particular lattice it's one half, and there is a theorem, uh, but uh, there are different lattices, so for example what you can do, you can play with a square city, but you can open or close squares. And here you have to specify whether you can go across the diagonal or just go to, let's suppose that we can only go to neighbors which share a side. So here then, uh, again, if you run computer experiments, you see that there is this phase transition at some transcendental number, 0.59. People put a lot of effort into it, supercomputers and all that. I think we know like 17 digits after the comma, and it's probably none of the numbers we know. Um, so uh, this is how the graph looks like. Uh, uh, if, if you plot it for some lattice, so what, what, what are plotted here are three or graphs for different sizes of boxes. So it says 100 by 100, 500 by 500, 1,000 by 1,000. So for each box, it's a smooth function. Why? Because probability of any configuration is a polynomial in P. If you have a box 1,000 by 1,000 with 1 million squares, it's a polynomial of degree 1 million. So it's a smooth thing. But is the size increase, degree of polynomial increase, and polynomials can approximate any continuous function. So what it does here, it approximates actually a jump function. Uh, up to PC it's zero, after PC it's close to one. And uh, uh, what, uh, of course, you can ask the question, what is PC? For physics, it's not interesting. So it's like liquids, they all boil with different temperatures, and water boils at 100 degrees. Well, it's not a fundamental property of number 100, it's a definition of boiling temperature of water, or definition of a number 100. We set 100 to be the temperature where water is boiling. So you cannot deduce it from first principles, you will get some transcendental number if you use other units. And it's not physically important. Physically, what is important is uh, how this phase transition goes. So, uh, nevertheless, PC, uh, there are some PCs which are transcendental, there are some where, we'll, we'll address this in five minutes, where you can calculate them, it's not always one half, one half is because of some self-duality, sometimes it's some funny number, like for example, for triangular bond, if you have triangular city, so it's, you imagine, like Manhattan, where you put diagonal streets, well, you take Barcelona, where there's diagonal, but you put these diagonal avenues, like every block, then, then it would be two sine pi over 18. Uh, it actually comes also from 0.5, but then you use Young-Baxter relation and you, you get a solution of a cubic equation. Uh, there is, uh, to get a phase transition, as I said, you need to send the size of the box to infinity, because any finite box gives you a smooth function. But uh, mathematicians uh, have sort of a trick where you don't send the size to infinity, you already start with the box infinity by infinity. 
Of course, you can drive south to north, so you just ask, so you start at the center, you start at Times Square, and you ask whether you can ex ex uh, <coughs> escape to infinity. And then it will be a function, which is also increasing in probability. And there uh, you can show that if it's a finite box, you escape by box n to n, then it will behave more or less like this one. But if it's infinite, uh, already limit is built in, it will be exactly zero, and then it will grow. So for p equal one, you always can escape, but for p between critical and one, the probability of escaping is smaller than one because always there is a probability that all the rows around you are closed. So there is a circle of closed rows which form an abstraction. And um, <clears throat> everything I formulated uh, forms theorems. And the interesting thing that uh, like many very smart people were involved, starting with Russo, Seymour Welsh, Broadband, Hermersley, Eisenman, Barsky, oh, there is a type, Eisenman, Barsky, Menshikov, uh, and uh, uh, all this, for example, what I formulated is formulas theorems like the values of PC or, or that the fact that there is this phase transition, that it's a continuous function uh, here which, which grows like that. Uh, so those were famous theorems. Uh, some of the papers were 100 page long, very ingenious both in terms of ideas and very technically demanding, uh, and people got some prizes for it. So what, uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, we uh, were doing other things. We were trying to understand physics, but in the way we were able to digest these earlier things, and uh, for example, what I formulated up to now, I'm going to show in the next uh, five slides or more. So the, these very complicated papers, they were digested uh, into something very, very, very short and concise. So I'm actually going to, to prove this sharpness of the phase transition. Now, why study this model? Uh, and why study PC? So do you see model of percolation criticality in real world if it's only one number? The surprising thing is, yes, you do. So here, uh, there is another computer experiment where we change PC and we start at zero in the city and we see where we can drive. So for small PC, we can drive only in very little till we hit the roadblocks. For bigger PC, we can drive more. For this is for bigger P. For PC, we can drive some fractal shape. For P bigger than PC, we can drive almost everywhere, save for some closed islands. Uh, so in real life, of course, you don't have constant P throughout the city. In some places, it's large. In some places, it's small. And people usually speak not about driving in the city, but rather about the forest burning or epidemic spreading. So P for a forest play, uh, the role of P plays by density of the trees at the temperature, because if it's hotter, drier, then the fire has easier time passing from tree to a tree. If trees are closed, it also has easier time. So if you uh, light a real forest fire, or rather you observe how some other people light a real forest fire and start by itself, then what you see that, uh, of course, it can happen that the fire burns all the way to some straight line, a railroad, for example, and then it cannot pass. But usually, if you take aerial pictures, you see that there is a fractal curve, which, which is the boundary of the fire. Unless, of course, it stops at the sea side in California or at the railroad somewhere. Uh, so what's the reason? Because there are different regions in the forest. If P is bigger than, uh, if P is smaller than PC, it doesn't burn at all. If P is bigger than PC in some region, it burns out completely. So fire burns, and it stops when P drops below PC. So at the region where it stops, P is approximately equal to PC. So you see exactly this sort of fractal shape which separates these two pictures, where nothing burns and everything burns. So there is this kind of interesting regime, P smaller than PC, nothing burns, you cannot move, P bigger than PC, everything burns, you can drive everywhere, and there is very rare regime, Curie point, P equal PC, where you have some fractal shape. Okay, and uh, the interesting thing is that it's sort of physicists understood it long ago, so the theorems I mentioned, they are from the 80s mostly. For example, uh, when I was a school child, we have a journal, which is like American Mathematical Monthly in the US, which is called Quantum in Russia, uh, and it had a small library of books, and there is one book which is called uh, Physics and Geometry of Disorder, so for Polish people it should be easy to read, you just substitute Kirillic for, 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 for Latin letters. Uh, and it, it had all the theorems I mentioned, but uh, written by a physicist, and you can even see the trees. And this is actually a picture there of a real experiment, the clusterization of gold, and you see these critical percolation clusters. This is a real experiment, this is a film, uh, aluminum film on, on glass, and the uh, acid is dropped and you get this fractal shape. This is a computer experiment of erosion, which is uh, 
different model, but boils down to the same phenomena, what, what is eroded. So it's, it's a really physical process which you can observe in nature, and uh, uh, we're discussing dimension two, it will become apparent later why. Uh, there are two reasons. Uh, one reason dimension two is, uh, you see it in nature when something on the surface happens. Uh, and uh, the second reason is that qualitatively we think that two and three are the same, but two we can do with physics arguments and mathematic arguments, and three we cannot do yet. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the main two, it's called planar duality, and um, here I formulated a model where you do percolation on hexagons. So you model a porous rock, so what you do, you toss a coin for every hexagon, if it comes up heads, then it's yellow or closed. If it comes up uh, tails or crowns, it's open. Uh, and uh, so it's like hexagonal city where you can move through white, uh, white hexagons in this beehive, so to say. Now suppose we put water on top. Uh, of course, for every uh, shape, there is some probability that the water can seep through. So. Uh, whether on this picture, on some picture it can, some can't, on this it can. So let's scan it. Let me see. Can one sip through here? Yes. Okay. Can one do it here? It's, it's, it's a nice exercise. If, if, if you cannot see it, I, I give you a telephone number. Krzysztof will give you a telephone number of oculist in Krakow who will do a new eyeglasses very cheaply or I can give you one in Geneva. Uh, but the, the question is, of course, it's not why you cannot see, whether it's wrong something with your eyes, uh, why it's difficult to see. So in this picture, as a matter of fact, you cannot. Uh, and uh, the reason is that, we'll discuss it later, that if there is a path, then uh, it's rather fractal. So it's rather windy, so it's, it's not straight. Okay, so the interesting observation you have here that uh, there is always either a top-bottom uh, crossing in white, so there is always either you can cross in white top bottom or in yellow left right. So there is this self duality. Is there is a white path top bottom? If there is none, there is a yellow obstruction. And since the model is kind of a self dual, you can switch the colors to negatives and it becomes the same model. It means that uh, yellow is uh, dual to blue, and it means that something special happens at one half. So once again, suppose we do percolation in some symmetric shape at uh, probability of uh, white being P, then probability of blue being P, probability of having this connection is always one minus probability of having horizontal obstruction. But uh, if uh, P was the probability of blue, probability of obstruction is one minus P. So you get a formula. Probability at P of vertical crossing is one minus probability at one minus P of horizontal crossing. Now, what happens if the symmetric shape, if the shape is symmetric, you can just flip it and horizontal and vertical are the same. If P is equal one half, here you get one half, and here you get one minus one half, uh, also one half. So you get formal probability is equal to one minus probability, so probability is equal one half. So uh, what we established here is that uh, if you have model with duality, where there is either white crossing or yellow obstruction, then something very special happens at P equal one half. At P equal one half for symmetric shapes, probability of crossing is always exactly one half. So it should be in my this previous picture, it should be exactly that point. So it's not a proof, for physicists it's a proof, but for mathematicians it's not a proof, so it uh, took famous Harry Keston to prove it, and um, this, this value of P. Now, um, once again, as, as I said, it's, it's the most important observation is this duality. Either you have a white crossing top bottom or there is a yellow horizontal obstruction. And uh, this is true for hexagonal lattice, but it's not true for square lattice because on square lattice, if you do cover squares in checkerboard fashion, chessboard fashion, then there are no crossings horizontal or, or vertical. Whereas if you cover bond on uh, square lattice, then it's self-dual, but uh, the dual lattice, you have to take the dual lattice, which is shifted by one half. Okay. So, uh, so this is a simple observation. It was made uh, almost immediately by people, but it took uh, really force of many people to, to deduce uh, from it the theorems, and lately it was digested so by 
myself uh, and then Hugo Dumini Ocupan and Tass Vincent Tassion. So Hugo actually will give a talk, uh, I think, tomorrow, but about another subject. So uh, how uh, you work with this? So what we know uh, is that probability to cross a symmetric shape is equal to one half. And I want to, uh, from this to deduce some bound on probability of crossing any shape. Suppose that we can do not symmetric shape, but uh, for example, rectangle one by two. Then I claim that we can do probability of crossing any rectangle we can estimate. Because suppose I have rectangle, so this is like one by four. So what I can do, I can cover it by sequence of small rectangles one by two. And if each of them is crossed, then there will be a crossing of big one, uh, which goes in a very sort of this snake-like fashion. So it's, it's kind of probability of crossing this is at least probability of having these crosses times probability of having these crosses. In principle, we always also use thing that if we superimpose them that they are positively correlated only increase probability, but that, 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 uh, that will be later in the talk, so it's, it's, there is a trivial way to circumvent this. So there is this uh, estimate, so probability of crossing big rectangle of size uh, A by 4A is at least probability of crossing 1 by 2 to the power 13. So what it means that uh, if I found a bound for some elongated rectangle, I can do any shape because I can do the snakes. And if I can do any shape, I can do any estimates. And then I can actually show that one half is indeed the phase transition point and many more. But I use that it's an elongated shape so I can do this th snake type things. So how do I start with a shape which is symmetric? So this is uh, what is called the same or Welsh theory. Uh, suppose that we have some shape which is not elongated, for example, like this tree, and suppose now the probability of crossing is A. So what I'm going to prove that probability of crossing twice longer is at least A square over 16. And it will be ca careful and tricky playing with percolation. So we know that probability of crossing left half is equal to A. Of course, we could add the probability of crossing both halves is A squared, but then how do we join these two crossings if we have left, right? So what we do, we choose the lowest possible crossing. So we take the crossing which is the bottom down, so it's the one which is, uh, has yellow abstraction from below. But the lowest crossing depends only on the space below. So uh, if, if I show you part of this part of the picture and say this is the lowest crossing, you'll be able to check. So the part above is completely independent. I can play with it again. So to construct the crossing of a big rectangle, I can start with this thing, which has probability, and I can play with the whatever is left of this rectangle. Now I do this uh, imaginary experiment. I do flip, I do symmetric shape, which looks like butterfly. And in symmetric shape, uh, probability of crossing is equal one half probability of crossing left right on symmetric shape, or is the same as probability of crossing right left is equal one half. So what I get that probability of this was a, and probability of going to these two arcs is one half. So you have probability a over two. We are almost there because we haven't necessarily reached the right half. We might have reached top. So we have either go there or there, uh, and there are two possibilities: we go to the right or we go to the top. Since the both possibilities together give a over two, then uh, at least one of those gives a over four. If left gives a over four, we are done. We constructed our crossing. It has probability a over four, which is bigger than a squared over 16. The tricky one is the second one. And the tricky, uh, so the first one is easy. The tricky one is the second one. And what we do, we take this crossing and we push it to the left up corner. Uh, the closest the possible. So probability of this A over 4. And then what we do, we play with again with the remaining part, which we can resample, and uh, we say that if this probability was A over 4, but also probability in the remaining part of having a part of symmetric crossing would be also A over 4. Uh, and together they will form a crossing, so A over 4 times A over 4 uh, is uh, A squared over 16. So that's the proof. So what is the difference with the other models? Uh, if you do other models, most people have heard of the Ising model, there is an interaction between different uh, colors. Uh, so uh, you cannot just uh, 
say I resample this half uh, because you need to take into account the effect of the boundary. But also here, uh, instead of saying that like these different events are positive correlated, we just do this hit, this uh, kind of tricky thing that we take the leftmost crossing and say that everything on the right can be played with again. So uh, what I did, I did this estimate that for any shape uh, at p equal one half, for any shape, probability of crossing would be bigger than some number. Uh, now, how do we deduce from this the phase transition? And for this, you need one notion, which is called uh, Russo Margulis lemma. And it's, it's kind of a trivial lemma, but it, it uh, has name of two people. So Russo discovered for percolation Margulis uh, in some group theoretic setting for a wider range of models. So it says that suppose you have some event, for example, crossing event, and you calculate what's the derivative of its probability. So you change p and you look how this function increases, you remember, so there was this sort of increasing function. You look at its derivative. So the derivative of this function is expected number of pivotal points. So what are the pivotal points? They are points which, if you flip, the event comes to be. So for example, here, you see there is this hexagon. It's yellow, I have no crossing. It's blue, I have a crossing. So why uh, this is a trivial statement? Suppose, so how do you increase the value of p? So one value, way to increase the value of p is just uh, uh, instead of doing a stupid model where you toss a coin for every hexagon and it comes tails or heads, it's yellow or blue, you toss a real number between 0 and 1 for every hexagon. So every hexagon has a number assigned. And then you declare this is the value of p, and every hexagon which has number below this value is blue, and above this value is yellow. Now, when you increase this value of p, more hexagons become blue. And uh, obviously, when you increase it continuously, it will happen one by one, because it's the chance that two hexagons have exactly the same real number assigned is zero. So it happened one by one, so you get, you indeed get, get this formula. But uh, why do I write expected number? Because there might be several pivotals. On this picture, there are at least two pivotal hexagons, which if you, if you, change, uh, if you change their uh, color, then, then, then uh, the blue crossing event can be. So the number of pivotal hexagons actually, actually can, be, um, can be very large, as, as, as we'll see later. Okay. Uh, now, okay, the batteries don't work. No, this. Uh, now, um, <coughs> suppose, uh, suppose uh, uh, that we have this lemma, so I almost gave a proof. Uh, now, uh, what we want to do, we want to estimate uh, how crossing probability changes. I want to show this sort of famous trans theorem that there is a phase transition. Uh, I, want, I want to show that uh, when, 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 I, when I take uh, uh, a very, very big, uh, very, very, very big uh, square, uh, then, um, yeah, okay. Uh, then uh, the derivative, it's either zero uh, or uh, very, very large when I increase this event. So I want to show that uh, uh, well, there is this uh, event, crossing event, the derivative is equal to expected number of uh, pivotal points. So I want to show that uh, this expected number either is zero or is very large. Okay, so how do we do it? First, uh, let's estimate probability that there is one pivotal point. So what we do, we take uh, our big rectangle. To have a pivotal point, you should have at least yellow abstraction. Probability of having yellow abstraction is exactly one minus probability of crossing. Well, it's not at least, it's actually exact identity. Okay, now, as always, we choose the lowest possible realization. So we put, move it to the bottom. And if there is no yellow pass, it means that from below, there is this blue things coming through. So every point on this lowest yellow pass can be reached from below by blue. Now, uh, to have a pivotal point, we need blue from above, and probability of having blue from above is at least probability of having blue throughout the whole rectangle, because it's harder to reach in bigger area than it's smaller. So probability to have a pivotal point is at least probability of yellow thing times probability of blue thing, so at least one minus p times p. And this is already shows you something, because we started writing estimate, and we want to show that this number is either large or small, and we got that it's 
at least one minus probability of crossing times probability of crossing. So if probability of crossing is small, we don't get a good estimate, we get almost zero. If probability of crossing is close to one, we don't get a good estimate, we get almost zero. We got a good estimate when probability of crossing is neither zero nor one. And that's the root to, to our estimate. So what we will see is that either probability of crossing is zero, but once it goes a little bit up from zero, it immediately goes all the way to one. And it's, it's because of this estimate. But this is just probability of having one pivotal. Uh, what is the chance of having many pivotals? Again, we choose the lowest possible, uh, leftmost possible realization, and we can play with this sector. And what we do, we separate it into concentric annuli. So if it's square, lattice annuli will be square. If it's hexagonal, hexagonal. And if you have n by n box, how many annuli you can do? You can do logarithm of n annuli. And in each of these annuli, by Russo seymour welsh theorem, you can uh, show that probability of connection is at least some constant. So there are log n annuli. Each of them has constant probability of connection. So uh, in total probability, expect number of connection at least constant times log n. But each such connection gives you a pivotal point here. So expected number of pivotal points, at least one minus probability of crossing times probability of crossing times constant log n. So that's the estimate. And uh, this estimate, it tells us what? It tells us the derivative of our function is at least function times one minus function times log n, which immediately shows that the function is inside this zigzag shape of which one over log n, because either it's close to zero, you can make no good estimate, but once it's bigger than one over log n, this gives you an estimate the derivative should be large. Then derivative is large, it goes up, and then it stays close to one. So this, this was a fa famous theorem with, uh, if you look at the Grimmett's book, which is the main book about percolation, it takes three chapters to prove and 90 something pages. People got prizes, ACM talks for it, but mm, I'm not saying that uh, we are smarter than those people. No, no, these people are very smart. And I'm not saying that it was possible to arrive at this argument before they had their complicated one. But what I found really nice about this area that the old theorems, which everyone in the area doesn't think anymore about, they actually get digested and people write simpler proofs and the books actually get easier by the year to read. So they get, get much, much, much easier. So uh, I said one over log n, but you can do better. You can do one over power of n. And it's uh, very easy because uh, from each of these uh, pivotals, you can work in its neighborhood in the same way and you get some more. And then you actually get uh, a fractional number of n and it will be a, the set where you land, it's actually a counter set. And it's very much like a counter, well, cookie cutters or something in dynamics. Uh, and uh, with what physicists can do, we can even prove now that it's n to the power of five quarters. It's a counter set of dimension five quarters. So it's, it's not on a line, it's on a fractal curve, so it's a flat, uh, it's a two-dimensional set. Okay, so this is, this is more or less what happened before physicists joined the subject and um, I emitted many interesting things. Uh, so if you are interested uh, uh, in the open problems, then uh, non-self-dual graphs are wide open. So for example, we don't know what to do with uh, percolation, site percolation on square lattice where you cover squares or vertices. And also dimension three is wide open because if you move through three dimensional cities where you can have streets and avenues left, right, and you have also some vertical traverses, then abstraction to a path is not a path, but it's a two-dimensional abstraction. So the model is not self-dual. A dual model to model of one-dimensional paths is model of two-dimensional films, and we still don't know how to work uh, with it. So for example, it's an open problem why the phase transition is continuous, why, why probability of uh, escaping to infinity, um, it, uh, so i shown here uh, in 2D it zero and then grows continuously, why you don't have a jump at this point, why it doesn't immediately go to some positive number. So that's a wide open problem. And just to sort of put it on similar perspective for the easing model, similar problem was settled in 3D only three years ago by Ugodiminiu, uh, Michael Eisenman, Ugodiminiu Kupan and Vlada Sidarevich. So it's, it's indeed 
in, indeed wide open. And then there are many other things like there is percolation on general graphs, where there is important Benjamin Schramm conjecture. There are two phase transitions there. Um, not, not the one, not, not the only this one, but also there is a phase transition from infinite number of clusters to one clusters, and then there is very interesting connection to Fox spaces, which was constructed by me and Schramm and not fully understood, and, and many, many, many other things. But the, indeed, the interesting question is 3D. And uh, if you go back to Olympiadzin School Mathematics, it's uh, just six years ago, someone brought to my attention that actually percolation problem first time appeared not in Broadband Hammersley, but in American Mathematical Monthly in 1894. So this is this percolation problem. Uh, by the way, this is a kind of problem school children were doing in 1894 uh, in the United States, <laughs> of all the places. Oh, by, by, by the way, this, this, this is actually a good, a good, a good question, how, how well you understand education. Uh, why school children were doing in 1894 in last grade of school and not doing anymore? Any? Who, who has an answer? Well, there are actually two answers, but uh, there is a mathematical answer and there is an educational answer. So who? No one knows the answer. Question. The question is, why in 1894 there were such problems in American Mathematical Monthly and not anymore? Why? I mean, you can't imagine in school children magazine this problem. <laughs> Can you? Well, there are, there are two, two things. One, mathematical. What is the year when, PG, when Henri Lebeck defended his PhD thesis? 1904. So uh, before 1904, we had to write this iterated integrals. We couldn't integrate with respect to area or with respect to, uh, with respect to lengths uh, on a curve or with respect to volume. So we could only do dx, dy, and we wouldn't write with respect to volume. We would write this dx, dy, etc. And the other thing is, is what's the percentage of uh, school children who were graduating, uh, of, of not school children, of children who went all the way to 10th grade in school? Well, it was around 10% in all countries, in Poland or Russia or France or US, it sort of was between like 7 and 15%. So essentially last year of high school was like first year of university. It's the same, it's, the percentage of people graduating from school was uh, there, uh, then was more than the percentage of people who go to university now in most countries, it's like 30, 40%. Uh, so we could, do this, uh, we could do this in school, but then we have to abolish general school education. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that, that's the, the percolation problem. So there are 50 rows of uh, 30 balls, uh, and they are drawn in randomly white and black. Uh, what's the probability there is a connection? So first, they say, well, if there is a connection, most likely it's a straight one, which we have seen not to be the case uh, because we have computer experiments. But then they calculate the probability of straight connection, which is very easy. Anyone can do it. And they get it wrong. They actually get it wrong. But then there is an editor's remark, this solution is not entirely satisfactory. I like it very much. When solution is wrong, you should say it's not entirely satisfactory. Uh, and, uh, well, he says that it will be uh, correct one will be published if editor receives it. But I don't think this same editor still works at American Mathematical Monthly. So we'll, we'll, we'll pass to actually calculating uh, the probability that there is a connection. And it's uh, to depercolation of a conformal field theory. So physicists... Uh, they not only studied such phenomena, they observed that there are different interesting fractional numbers involved when you calculate uh, probabilities, exponents, dimensions, like for example, five quarters, uh, this uh, thing I said, it's Hausdorff dimension of this pivotal set. Uh, and um, maybe the first serious attempt was by Landau, the so-called mean field theory, but it was only giving integer numbers, not giving like five quarters. Well, it was giving uh, rational numbers, but not funny rational numbers, like it was giving three halves for thirds, but not five quarters. And then um, the Stuckelberg uh, proposed uh, renormalization theory, or normalization theory, and uh, Kadana, Fisher, Wilson, many others uh, developed it, and Wilson got a Nobel Prize for it. So basically, the thing is that you want to decrease the number of degree of freedom in your model. So what you do, you take, for example, this percolation lattice, and in each four by four block, you have a democratic vote, whether this block should be yellow or blue. Uh, and, well, maybe you should do five by five, so there is no tie. And then you, if majority is yellow, you put yellow, if majority is blue, you put blue. Now, obviously, you change the scale lattice by a factor of four. 
Obviously, you have less degrees of freedom because instead of 16 uh, coin tosses, you get one coin toss. Obviously, you lose some information. You don't get bijection. There are artificial models on Sierpinski gaskets where you indeed have a bijection after renormalization, so uh, everything is fine. You can rigorously analyze, but here uh, you don't have bijection. But there is a hand-waving argument that actually this transformation, it sort of preserves the properties, only you have to adjust P. So basically, changing of scale and changing of P is a flow on a big dimensional many dimensional space of all percolation models, which includes all graphs, some continuous models. Uh, and when you do this repeatedly, you just flow, flow, and the fixed point PC, it arises as an interesting uh, fixed point of this flow, a saddle point, so there are directions where you are attracted, there are directions where you repelled, and uh, this is why it's very hard to observe in nature. And the points where everything burns and everything doesn't burn, they arise as a fixed points on the boundary of this space. Uh, so they are, they are far away and they are trivial. So this is the picture of Wilson, and then you can, um, actually the contribution of Wilson that he realized uh, which uh, ansatz uh, which uh, to make about behavior of different quantities, so then from that picture you can then make calculations what are the critical exponents and dimensions. So this is how it looks, for example, for percolation. So it's not a rigorous thing, but it leads you, if you renormalize it, if you take P small than PC, it leads to very to picture which is where everything is uh, uh, not burned. P bigger than PC, everything burned. For P or PC, you get this sort of fractal things. Uh, and uh, then the next big thing came from Polikov, who conjectured that uh, this... Uh, point uh, which, uh, which, which you have uh, fixed from the Wilson picture, it is scale invariant because it's invariant under normalization. It's rotation invariant because it's unique. But Polikov also conjectured that it's inversion invariant. And it turned out that then you can do more calculations than Wilson. And then Polikov had a bright idea. Well, so he's a famous theoretical physicist. And uh, he said, well, Conformal transformations of the plane, they are locally, uh, well, they are basically like Möbius transformations, they are translations, rotations, and inversion. But locally, all conformal transformations are like that. Let's assume that it's invariant under all conformal transformations. And then he was able to do many predictions. So here, he uh, did not work out the boundary things. Uh, so his thing is very non rigorous. Cardi, John Cardi, and other physicists did. Uh, and mathematicians know a very good example of conformal invariance. So random walk is not conformally invariant. Here I moved random walk on square lattice by exponential map, and I get random walk on curvilinear lattice. But if you do Brown in motion, it's conformally invariant. There are many proofs of that in relation to harmonic functions, stochastic calculus, where you just calculate Laplacians. And you see here then where the mesh of the lattice is small, this curve looks almost like that. So uh, that is not true in 3D, by the way, and this is also one of the reasons why we're doing 2D. So similar things is expected to, do, to be true for percolation, and 2D CFT was used by physicists to make many, many predictions. So for example, suppose uh, you, you look at the crossing. You took at the leftmost crossing. Then its Hausdorff dimension is four-thirds. So what does it mean? It means that if you take box 1,000 by 1,000, Average number of hexagons will be 1,000 to the power of 4 thirds. Thousands to the power of 4 thirds is how much? Oh, I have it written there. Okay, 1,000 to the power, it's a test of reading. 1,000 to the power of 4 thirds is how much? 10,000. So the crossing is very wiggly. It's to cross distance 1 kilometer, you need to walk 10 kilometers. Okay, million to the power of 4 thirds. How much is million to the power of 4 thirds? It's 100 million. So you need to walk in north. That's why it's difficult to trace. And uh, if you just count the number of blue hexagons, then dimension is 91 over 48. And that already shows that there are some interesting mechanics through. So here it's an example where you can pass through and there is this intricate cluster. And uh, physicists, they did many, many, many predictions. So here there is a, some predictions which eventually were proved with Wendel and Werner. Uh, so for example, probability of escaping to infinity goes zero. And then this function, which behaves like p minus pc to a power uh, beta, where beta is 5 over 36. Once again, dimension 3, we don't know how to prove it. We expect that, again, it's similar behavior, but the numbers probably are transcendental. But here, it's, it's a theorem that it's number 5 over 36. So um, 
let me maybe just uh, skip here. Uh, so um, the um, mathematics was jump-started by a very interesting paper by Languens, Puyot, and Sanoban. So there are two papers by Languens himself, and then one with Puyot, one with Puyot, Sanoban, where he numerically studied uh, this uh, probability of a crossing. Uh, and then Michael Eisenman came over and said, well, it should be conformally invariant because it's conformal field theory. So he uh, numerically checked that it's true. And then John Cardi heard about it from Eisenman. He actually wrote a formula. What is the probability of crossing at PC? So if you take a rectangle, uh, any topological rectangle, topological rectangle plane has conformal modulus. Because any rectangle can be mapped to a half plane by Riemann mapping theorem. And three boundary points can be mapped to 0, 1, and infinity by Riemann, by Möbius transformation. And there is a fourth point left, which is mapped to point M. So M is conform modulus. And that's the pro pro uh, probability of a crossing. So it's gamma is gamma function. M is this conform modulus. 2F1 is uh, hypergeometric function. And uh, the way how... Mm, John Cardi got it, he moved point Z on the boundary, and he observed that both probability of crossing and its derivative have some physical meaning. And they are related to Riccati type equation, uh, which is the simplest equation, uh, which has no solution in algebraic functions. And that's why this, well, this is this function, definition of this function, just the solution of this equation. Or you can also write a series, so integral, it's, it's, a, it's actually a primitive of a, fractional power polynomial. So it's a primitive of uh, m times 1 minus m to the power of minus, uh, what is the number? Minus 2 thirds. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we were able to do, we were able to prove this formula and from this uh, formula deduce all other things. Now, uh, Leonard Carlison, who is, well, the greatest complex analyst alive, and he saw this, he immediately saw that uh, he has seen this formula also in his course of complex analysis. And uh, if you pass course of complex analysis, at one point you are taught that you can write formulas for maps of polygons to polygons, the so-called schwarz christoffel maps. And for triangles, uh, they, those are hypergeometric functions. It's exactly the same. If, 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 if uh, there are n points uh, and uh, there are, you know, the slopes of the sides, you get an integral of a fractional polynomial of degree n minus 1. So here it's integral fractional polynomial of degree 2, which is hypergeometric function, and those are the slopes of the sides measured in uh, radians, uh, well, radians divided by pi. And if you normalize this to a triangle, then you get the formula that probability of crossing an equilateral triangle from a side length one to a part of the other side length L tends exactly to L when the mesh of the lattice goes small. So this observation of Leonard really got uh, everyone in probability excited because the, you had this beautiful formula and now you have this formula which is much more beautiful. It just has one letter L. Uh, and uh, also at the time we thought that it has to say something special about hexagonal lattice, it does not. It says something special about percolation being related to 60 degrees in its parameters. But um, so that's what uh, we um, uh, proved. And now uh, I'm going to tell a proof of this in the remaining 10 minutes. And the funny story is that the original proof was <laughs> rather complicated. And then at one point, I sent my PhD student to find the proof for, um, for a square lattice. And uh, the guy is as disorganized as I am, so on the way he forgot what, what he was sent to do, so instead he came up with an easy proof for triangular lights, much easier than the original one. Uh, and let me just, uh, maybe I'll skip that, that Schramm thing. Yeah, I'll give this proof. So this, this uh, uh, work, uh, let me see, with Misha Christoforov, it's, well, his name will appear in the next slide. Uh, so the mm, original proof was that instead of moving z on the boundary, we would move z inside, and we study the probability that there is a blue crossing which separates c, b, and a from uh, a and z from c and b. So this is h a of z function. You can also write h b and h c. Uh, so what we proved is that uh, these three functions, these three probabilities, they are approximately discrete harmonic. And they have some nice boundary values, and we can deduce the Cardi's formula for, 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 for them. Now, uh, what uh, Misha observed is that actually they are not 
approximately harmonic. They are exactly harmonic if you properly define them. And uh, first, uh, what we do, we do slightly different uh, model. We do what is called O1 model or loop model. So we draw perimeters of my clusters. So you see what uh, we can do. We can draw a bunch of loops. If you have a bunch of loops, you can start covering them each time when you cross the loop, you change color from yellow to blue and vice versa. So there is a bijection between blue and yellow pictures and loop pictures. Is it clear that there is a bijection? So it's just this picture which explains everything. So it just uh, either you start with this picture and then you draw the perimeters and you get this picture. Or you start with this picture and you fill the cover so it's like children's coloring book. And then there is an interesting thing that probability of horizontal yellow or vertical blue has a very nice meaning in this picture. You do the boundary conditions in this picture that there are loops, but there are also four sources at points A, B, C, and Z. And four sources, they can be connected either uh, horizontally or vertically. And if they are connected vertically, it means that there is a blue crossing in between. If they are connected horizontally, it means there is a yellow obstruction in between. So we instead of percolation, study a loop model where, which studies this loop configurations, but probability of crossing is kept now as probability of this out of the two pictures. Okay. Now, uh, the nice uh, contribution uh, of uh, Misha and myself, Misha Christopherov and myself, uh, was that um, it turns out that this function H A of Z can be formulated in terms of looking at the following pictures. You take three sources on the boundary and one source inside. So this is no longer a picture which is a good covering book. If a child, if you give it to your child, uh, he will become very agitated and start throwing markers at you because when you start covering it, it's all okay till you come to the point Z. And this, this line should separate blue from yellow, but here, well, you come to a contradiction. So this is what physicists would call a disorder operator. So you can think of it as a point, as like in a, some sci-fi novel that there is this point. If you walk around this point, then blue becomes yellow. So you come to the negative of the space. But if you walk the second time around, then yellow becomes blue and you are back where you were. So it is a theorem that probability of this configuration new model is exactly the same as probability of that configuration in old model. And the proof, I don't have time to tell it, but it works exactly like proofs I did before. You take this rightmost crossing, and then you just resemble this part. You just resemble this white part, but you resemble this with this twist uh, that you have this disorder operator. So this is the definition of function, new function H A of Z. And of course, if Z is on the boundary, then, then, you, get, uh, then you get exactly the probability of such a picture. So it's, you, get, you, you get exactly, exactly what we are looking for. Okay, so this is this function. There are three functions, H A, H B, and H C. And it's clear that the sum of these three functions is equal to one. Why? Because if I have four sources, and I ask what is the different possible ways to connect them, there are three possible ways to connect them. So if you normalize uh, your sums, you generate functions, your partition functions, so that uh, it is probability, then the sum should be one because it's uh, three mutually exclusive events. So we already found something which is conformally invariant in my model. We found function constant one. It is conformally invariant, but it's trivial. So we want to play more and we take the sum, but we put other uh, things. We put, uh, uh, we put uh, coefficients one tau and tau square where there is cube of roots of unity. And what I'm looking for, I want to check Cauchy-Riemann equation or Laplacian, and if I have a function f which is defined uh, uh, on vertices or on uh, edges of hexagonal lattice, this is the form of Cauchy-Riemann equation, that sum at these three edges or these three vertices, well, better, three edges, uh, with coefficients one tau and tau square, where tau is cube root of unity is equal to zero. Why? Because this is more or less like saying that this primitive contour integral is equal to zero, this contour sum, because this is equal to i, this vector, this is i times tau, this is i times tau squared. Because if you have this property at this point, if you have it uh, at all the other points, you can draw all these triangles, then this 
edges inside, they will cancel out, and you get that your function has a big contour integral equal to zero. So if you have uh, this original property around every vertex, you can sum it and you get that global contour sums are zero, which means that if you pass to a limit, your function will be analytic because its contour integrals will be zero. So we have to check this property and uh, we check it for a function not HA plus HB plus HC because it has this property, it's identically one, but HA plus tau HB plus tau squared HC. And uh, it's a convex sum of numbers one tau and tau squared. So, uh, well, well, that's the proof. So the proof, uh, it comes uh, from a fact that if you uh, look at the possible contribution of different functions to HA at this point, you can always extend a little bit to get HA, H, HB at this, HC at that, and uh, if you analyze all the possible pictures how local neighborhood of a point looks like, there are basically three versions. There is this triplet that there is a uh, curve from A which goes here, and then you can prolong it to this point or prolong to that, and then contributions to three functions are one, one, one. Or you come here and there is already a loop, but then you can play railroad tracks and you can do this hook from the left or hook from the right. Again, contributions one, one, one to three different functions. So if you sum them with coefficients one tau tau squared, one plus tau plus tau squared is equal to zero. And the most interesting one is that suppose you hit not uh, a loop, you hit a curve which connects to other points on the boundary. Then when we switch train tracks, you get instead of HA, you get HC here, and here you get HB. And they come in my function with coefficients tau and tau squared, so I have contributions one, tau, and tau squared. But when I do cauchy riemann I have to multiply by one, tau, and tau squared. So I get one times one plus tau times tau plus tau squared times tau squared. So I get one plus tau squared plus tau to the power four, again zero. So you, you, you get this thing. So you get that my function, my function uh, HA tau plus H H A plus tau H B plus tau squared H C is analytic, and now it remains to figure out the boundary condition. So what happens on the boundary when Z hits arc A B? I can have this picture, I can have that picture, but I can't have picture like this because then two arcs would intersect. So on this arc, I can have only combination of H A and H B. So I only have combination of these two. So I have a convex sum of one and tau. So what I get is that I have an analytic function inside and arc AB is mapped to convex sum of one and tau. Arc BC is mapped to convex sum of tau tau squared. Arc AC is mapped to convex sum of one and tau squared. So I get an analytic function which maps my domain onto an equilateral triangle. And that gives you the formula of Carlesson. If you map to half plane by Christopher Schwarz, that gives you the formula of Cart. And from that, you already can unwind the other things. It's, it's a matter of calculations, well, where you plug in the probability of crossing, so I won't show in. Uh, and um, many things uh, come in, but there are more open questions. We still cannot uh, do non-self-dual lattices. We don't know how to do something in 3D. As I said, Dumeniu, uh, Kopan, Eisenman, and Sidarevich, they did something for easing. And, uh, for example, if you know what model, easing model is, high temperature easing should converge to percolation that follows from renormalization theory. So if this is renormalization, not percolation, but easing magnet, there is low temperature frozen. There is critical point which we worked out with Dima Chilcock. But high temperature should converge to percolation and that, that we don't know. So that's, that's maybe the end of the talk. But uh, uh, in the remaining two minutes, I wanted to say once again thank to the organizers. It's, it's really a spectacular thing, and I haven't been to such a big and multidisciplinary disciplinary congress. So how many people are there? 460? Okay, so what makes, makes me really scared is that we'll have an international congress of mathematicians in St. Petersburg in two years and a half. So on my part, it's a bit scary because it's scale of 10, uh, and it's probably amount of effort scales not linearly, but like power 91 over 48 or some other big power. But uh, on the other hand, I hope uh, to see many of you there. I hope it will be a nice experience. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a few pub publicity words. I mean, St. Petersburg is a nice city, as beautiful as Krakow. Uh, well, the only difference is it's a bit bigger, but uh, otherwise equally beautiful. 
uh, and traditionally it served the quote, Russian window to Europe. Uh, uh, and on the positive side, uh, the, it will be visa-free, so that was already uh, tried for the World Cup, where a ticket to the World Cup was uh, working as a visa at the border, so uh, they promised to have the same for mathematicians as a registration with the Congress. So in our age where visas are getting difficult to, to get, I hope, I hope it will uh, entice many of you to come. And the other thing is that uh, we will have a large program not only to help people from developing countries, but also to help young mathematicians to attend and you will receive shortly, we'll send some circular letter to adhering organizations of IMU. We'll try to be in contact with local funding agencies, academies of science uh, and mass societies uh, to sort of have a system of postdocs or graduate students going to ICM with us covering uh, local expenses for many of them, whereas people from the respective countries covering the travel and doing the selection part. So I hope to see many, well, Poles, Americans, Europeans from well, people from any country there. So see you in St. Petersburg, and thanks very much for this organization. I hope we'll, we'll, we'll try to arrive at the same standard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the beautiful lecture. Uh, I don't know whether questions are allowed, but maybe one short question would be allowed. Yes. Okay. Sorry, SLE? Ah, how they, do they come in the picture? Okay, so it's, uh, well, there was this 25th frame about SLE. So Adet Shram, uh, well, who was a really great mathematician, unfortunately died in a hiking accident. Uh, so he um, still can't forgive myself that he was giving lectures in Tennessee on circle packing, and I planned to go, then I was too lazy to fly over the ocean, and uh, he instead gave lectures about a silly, that was 1998, and my, my friends brought me Xerox copies of his slides, and I looked at it and said, what a ridiculous idea, I like Lovni Revolution, I like percolation, but why, why, why would I need to combine the two? Uh, and uh, so I still can't forgive me that I didn't go there, so this is a Xerox copy of this slide from his first talk. Uh, so. Uh, he said the following, that, uh, look, suppose that uh, I don't know how to prove crossing probability. Uh, so I, I did it in the end, but even if I do, what I do next? How do I proceed? How do I deduce other properties? I need to work with something more, something richer. On the other hand, I cannot speak about the full picture. It's too difficult. It's a random coloring of a graph. It's okay, but when you pass to a limit, it's random coloring of a plane. How do you address it? What is a random coloring of a plane? It's a measurable covering, continuous covering. So in the end, we addressed it. It's some Fox space. It's, it's a very interesting thing. So we have a paper with Adet which addresses this question. So he suggested to look at the interface between two clusters. So you are a myopic ant who goes on this lattice and explores it in one myopic because to explore this interface, you use left-hand rule. You don't need to know the global picture. You need to know only immediate neighborhood. And he said that, look, if this is the right, and the model is conformally invariant. Here is a random broken line. Let's pass to the scaling limit. It will be a random curve, fractal curve probably, conformally invariant. So the theorem which Adet proved is that if an interface has conformally invariant limit, it's SLE. Now, what is LE? What is Lovner revolution? So Lovner had a theorem which says that if you draw a slit and you open it up by map GT, which is properly normalized at infinity, then you can write this equation. So there is WT function which tells you what GT does. So you can imagine you drive a car if you know at a constant speed, 55 miles per hour. If you know how you steer the steering wheel, function WT, you can reconstruct by solving some equation the, the motion of the car. But you need to integrate. On the other hand, if you draw a motion of the car, you can run the car and you see how the steering wheel turns. Now here you do the same, but uh, the speed is not 50, 55 miles per hour, it's two two hyperbolic miles per hour, two for historical reasons. Uh, it's, it should have been one hyperbolic mile per hour, but it's two hyperbolic miles per hour. And what Schramm said that, look, if I want a random curve, let's put a random thing in place of WT. And the easiest random thing is Brown in motion. So if you put Brown in motion, you get exactly all the curves which arise from the latest model. So this is actually the proof of it. Well, that's the, the full proof of it. So if 
you take a curve which arises from a model, you split it into parts, you put it as a composition of maps G epsilon, then you deduce that uh, if your thing has conformal invariant, then this driving function, because it's additive, you get the driving function should be split into identical increments, identically distributed increments. And the only process by which you can do it is Brown in motion, so it's a continuous process. So basically what Schramm observed is that uh, the scaling limits of these curves, they would be like a random walk or Brown in motion on the model A space. In this case, the model A space is trivial. It's a model A space of a half plane with two marked points, zero and infinity, an element of metric at infinity marked. But you can do it also on the Riemann surface. So uh, what happens, how you do, um, how you connect it to Cardi formula. If you know Cardi formula, you can draw this curve, you can sample crossing probabilities, how they change, and you deduce that, not only you deduce that dub, W is a Brown in motion, you actually deduce that W is Brown in motion with speed six. I have somewhere a proof here. So just to show that it's not complicated, it's just basically total probability formula. You play with different uh, functions, and, and in the end you, you get uh, Mm, from total probability form or something like this, you plug in the Cardi form of what is the value of crossing probability, and when you expand to a fun, you, you, get, uh, you get that for your driving force, expectation is zero, and expectation of square is equal to 60, so it's six times Brown in motion. So basically, I, I think here, like, there are two, two important ideas that this thing is a kind of Brown in motion in the model space, but also you get non-trivial numbers because you run uh, stochastic calculus. Uh, when you run stochastic calculus, you get non-trivial formulas because dB times dB is equal to dt. So you, you get non-linearity because of that. And depending on which function you do, if you do function for easing model, you get speed 3 and so on. So that's, that's in the nutshell what is, what is going on. Yeah, I hope that, I hope that helps. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.